Thank you very much for coming uh, here today. And um, I guess the, the task falls to me to try to set the scene and suppose some, some uh, questions uh, for discussion. And uh, so I'm proud to have the chance to do that. And the theme is innovate to survive. And I think the question is for Britain, can we build on our innovation history or will we become innovation history? And I want to talk a little bit about that. And I want to start by talking about the Olympics. Uh, anybody enjoy the opening ceremony of the Olympics? Yeah. It was pretty good, wasn't it? Pretty good, I have to say, um, having seen the press coverage in a somewhat negative way, you know, beds were too short, buses were getting lost and so on. Uh, I was a little bit nervous when I saw the grass green and the peasants playing cricket. Was this going to be a bit rubbish? Uh, and then the Industrial Revolution happened. And it was amazing, wasn't it? It was something really to be proud of. And I think the whole nation kind of came together in excitement behind what we were doing. And we have got a huge innovation heritage of which to be proud. Uh, not least the Industrial Revolution, which happened uh, here first. Um, and 2012, I think, celebrated a range of our achievements in a, in a pretty special uh, way. But I want to just start by reflecting a bit on our innovation um, history. And I want to start with uh, 1865 and James Clark Maxwell. James Clark Maxwell, a poet of some success, but also the guy who made discoveries around electromagnetic radiation that underpin the science behind Wi-Fi, radio, television, and all of the things that power everything we do today and everything that we have in our pockets. I was going to talk about Alexander Graham Bell, and maybe he'll show up at some point. Um, Alexander Graham Bell in uh, 1876. That's not Alexander Graham Bell. It may be one of his colleagues. 1876, the discovery of the telephone again, or the invention of the telephone again uh, in the UK. And of course, we are used to that technology. In fact, I saw a report yesterday that said that smartphones are going to outnumber people on the planet next year. Thanks, Alexander. Uh, what have we got here? 1898, Marconi. Anybody know where Marconi established the world's first factory producing radios? Enfield? Yeah. Chelmsford, apparently. Chelmsford, not bad. Good guess. 1898, the first factory uh, producing uh, radios in the UK. And now, of course, today you get up, you might listen to the radio on your radio, but you might listen to the radio on your smartphone. You might go downstairs, turn on the television, listen to the radio there, come into work, listen to the radio on your computer, smartphone on the way home, another device but it pervades everything we do, and still a very successful way of communicating uh, with people. 1898, made in the UK, and here's Spotify, another way of listening to, uh, uh, to radio content, audio content. 1926, John Logie Baird, television, where was that invented? Here, the first time moving images were transmitted over those radio waves. Again, proud history of innovation, that I think is the coronation, and we had the royal wedding on YouTube, which you can watch on your smartphone, on any device, anywhere in the world. And in fact, a child with a smartphone can now take video and broadcast it to the entire world costlessly at the push of a button. And it's not long ago that only the BBC could do that through world service transmitters and satellite dishes in the Ascension Islands and so on. So what a pace of change that we've seen. All of that uh, innovation coming from Britain. And then when I talk about uh, computing, in 1936, Alan Turing wrote his, his first paper on computable numbers. <laughs> Anybody what, know what this is a few years later? This is Colossus, the first programmable computer uh, built in Bletchley Park. Colossus, first programmable computer in the world uh, made in Britain. And just a few years later, 1951, anybody know what this is? Leo, Leo the computer. <laughs> well done. 10 points. So I'm trying to wake you up, guys. <laughs> it's Movember. <laughs> I love these old photographs. Uh, Leo was uh, built for the use of the J Lyons company running tea rooms across the UK. Um, it was the first uh, workplace computer, computer to use for business. And the interesting thing is. Um, they had excess capacity, and you could buy time on Leo, and they sold it, uh, amongst others, to Ford for their payroll processing. And today we have Amazon with the world's leading cloud computing business based on selling off the surplus capacity that they have in their infrastructure. So the model was invented here in Britain in the 1950s. 
1981. BBC, BBC Micro. Anybody have one of these? A few people? Um, this was an amazing uh, phase for computing in the world, and Britain was world leading. This brought computing into the home and into the classroom for the first time. Now, I couldn't afford one of these, but in 1982, I was able to get hold of one of these. Anybody have one of these? Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Fantastic device. Rubbery keyboard, impossible to type on, and a little tape recorder that went round and round making a buzzing noise. Invented here in Cambridge. The other day, I was talking to some politicians and saying, it's a shame that Google wasn't invented in Cambridge and all of these other great internet companies weren't invented in the UK because we had the technology and we had the computer scientists at that time. What happened? Today, we're used to having computers everywhere. I've now got, alongside my ZX Spectrum, I've got a what's called a Chromebook. This is built by Samsung. This cost 200, 229 pounds boots up in four seconds and connects to the entire web and all of the computing and access to the web is done on this device. Um, and that's helping computers get into every room in the house, into schools and really uh, making access to the web much cheaper and easier for everybody. And a device like this doesn't have any software on it that you need to manage. So everything's done in the internet. It makes it incredibly simple um, for everybody to be able to, uh, to use. And then of course, the World Wide Web. I didn't realize this, but you can actually access the first ever web page still. I had a look at it yesterday. This is, this is the page that Tim Berners-Lee put together uh, in 1980, 1991 working at CERN. Again, uh, produced via Britain that led to the foundation of the World Wide Web. And we know this is for everyone. We now have 2.4 billion people around the world connected to the web. A billion people on Facebook, 800 million people actively on YouTube. And this is people not just reading the web, as you could with that first web page, but producing the web. We're all producing the web, uh, videos, tweets, status updates, comments, reviews. We're all producing the web, 2.4 billion people. And by the end of the decade, there will be 5 billion people online on the planet. So this is something that is at the beginning of a second industrial revolution. We're at the beginning of that re revolution. So how are we doing in the UK? Given that history, given the fact that all of our science and invention and innovation has underpinned everything uh, that powers the modern world of the web, how are we doing uh, in the UK? actually pretty well. And this is a, a story that I think is not well told and not well known. Let's look at some basic facts around the UK. This is the percentage of GDP that comes from the internet economy. So the internet economy, which is consumers and businesses buying things online, the infrastructure that's associated uh, with doing all of that, and the products and services that are uh, bought and sold online. And this is from some work by uh, Boston Consulting Group. And you can see here, this is uh, 2010. And you can see the UK, with 8% of GDP coming from the internet economy, is ahead of Germany, France, Italy, Russia, South Korea, China, and the US. We're a nation of digital shopkeepers in the UK. What is behind this? Um, it's powered by consumers. So over 60% of that um, GDP uh, contribution comes from people uh, buying products and services online, paying for their um, devices and their access, whether it be broadband, um, or 3G access. So it's powered by consumers, but also it's really driven by small businesses. So at Google, we know this because in the UK, we have getting on for 200,000 business customers. Um, and they are small businesses that are reaching the entire uh, web, the entire world. You don't have to start up and be focused on your local area or your national market. You can be focused on a global market of potentially 2.4 billion people from the start. So the internet economy in the UK is doing well. Um, it's hard to see because, like the early days of electricity, it's scattered across all the different sectors. And we think about transport, we think about communication, and we think about utilities as sectors. And the internet economy is a bit like the early days of electricity. People are using it, some of them, in some places. When electricity started, some companies had a head of electricity because it was new and it could kill you. And in some companies now, you'll find that there's a head of digital or a head of e-commerce. And I think that's because it's new. I don't think it can kill you. Um, but it is difficult for people to understand it. And I think it won't be uh, very long before people realize that the internet and the real world are the same place. And actually, that the internet can help us be more productive and effective and better in touch with our customers, whatever we do uh, in business. So that's 2010. Projection for 2016, based on kind of growth rates and the underlying drivers here, is 12% of GDP in the UK coming from the internet economy, at a time when um, other sectors' growth are uh, quite sluggish. 
So there's a good opportunity for us to retain our lead there. And as I say, that's driven by consumers and it's driven by small businesses. When our infrastructure and a bunch of the other stuff associated with the internet is no better than anybody else's. We just got off to a good start. We've got good, competitive, good, good competition amongst the companies that are online. Uh, we've got a good degree of innovation in our small businesses. And actually now what you're seeing is some of the larger businesses are starting to make sense of this. So when I started at Google, my job was to look after our business and operations in the UK. And I'd look at the top 10 online retailers. And when I started uh, nearly six years ago, uh, the top 10 online retailers were online retailers. And now, over half of them are offline retailers. They're the high street names that you know and trust. And what that says is that traditional businesses are starting to understand that the internet and the real world are the same place. And if you look at somebody like John Lewis, they're very good now at making the value proposition on the website and the, in the store uh, match up and having the store people enthusiastic about the website. When they started, the store people thought the website was going to kill them. Now they realize, actually, it helps them serve customers. And somebody who, who buys online and who buys in store is a more valuable and loyal customer as a result of accessing them through different channels. Big challenge for lots of businesses to change because they're not set up to do this and to, to move at the pace that the consumer moves at. Big opportunity for Britain. We're good at this stuff. We're ahead of the curve. And it's small businesses uh, like this. This is the Cambridge Satchel Company. This was started by a mother in her kitchen with 600 pounds. And now they're exporting funky satchels uh, around the world to retail and also to be bought by uh, the website business. It's a great example of how low the barriers to entry for an international uh, retailing business or export business can be. Uh, another example of mine that I think really ex exhibits the um, opportunities of the internet. When I started at Google again in my first year, I met a guy uh, who ran a company called Scott Web. And one or two of you may have heard me talk about this before because it's my favorite example. So apologies if you have. Uh, Scott Webb sells tartan and kilts and sporrans. And how do you do that in the traditional world? You find a location where you can get a shop where people in the market for tartan and kilts and sporrans might be passing by, so potentially Edinburgh. And then hopefully you have some attractive window displays that people come into the shop, they buy your stuff, they might even let you take their name and address and send you a, a catalog or a mailer every so often. That's the way to do it. At some point, you know, your local market has probably got enough tartan skirts and you may have saturated the demand. Now, how do you grow beyond that? Because if you start to reach further and further afield with traditional marketing, it's very hard to know whether you're catching people at the right time when they're in the market for traditional Scottish gear. But going online, every time somebody types kilt or tartan or sporran into Google anywhere in the world, Scott Web can appear. And so they can actually create uh, the uh, products and services you want. This is, they've got a great website, by the way. This is the Google tartan, which they kindly created. For. I think it's rather too tasteful actually. But if you go to their website, you can make your own tartan. They've been so successful, they've been able to save a, a traditional uh, weaving mill called Dalglish Limited, which was going to close because of the demand that they've been able to generate um, for traditional Scottish merchandise. 70% of their sales now come from outside Scotland. That kind of success story is happening day in, day out. And the small businesses that are using the internet uh, with a website and doing online marketing, either with Google or other people who are also good at this stuff, those small businesses are growing between two and four times faster than those that don't use the web. There's a big growth gap. The, the web-using businesses are growing faster. They're exporting more. In fact, double the proportion of sales are coming from exports in web-using businesses than those that aren't using the web. And they're uh, producing and creating growth. So Cambridge Satchel Company going from a kitchen operation to starting to employ people. That's happening at a small scale, but across <coughs> hundreds of thousands of businesses. We've done a program uh, over the last couple of years in the UK called Getting British Business Online, which is designed to encourage people who think that the web's not for them to build their own website with no technical knowledge in less than 30 minutes. And we've had nearly 200,000 businesses go through that process to get online. It's not difficult, and it can be fast, and it can be done with no technical knowledge now. It's a huge opportunity. And those that aren't on online, we know, are not growing as fast and not being uh, as successful. So what will we make of this opportunity we have this heritage, we have this history of innovation, we're actually quite good at being a nation of digital shopkeepers. What will we make of this? And this is, this is where I wanted to try to sort of start to frame some questions, hopefully that uh, there'll be an opportunity to discuss as we go through the day. Uh, well, let's look at uh, households in the UK. There are currently um, 16 million adults that lack basic online skills in the UK. 16 million adults who um, are not skilled up enough to use email or search or the basic services uh, of the web. 8 million people in the UK who have never used the internet. 
Now, obviously, you might say, well, <laughs> you care about that because you're Google. But actually, UK should care about it because being online, we know uh, from independent research, saves households on average £550 per annum because they're able to find goods and services at better prices and shop around. Uh, they have access to a range of free services where the alternatives cost. So, for example, email rather than sending things through the mail or Skype rather than international telephone call rates. Um, and there's a consumer surplus from all of the free um, stuff and activity and entertainment and um, in, uh, information and education that they can gain, gain online. And that has been estimated by economists to be worth 5 to 7% of uh, the average income, which would equate to about £1,400 a year. And uh, Martha Lane Fox did some great work on Race Online 2012, where she tried to quantify the value of moving one or two government interactions to households. And that's worth hundreds of pounds a year as well. So there's a benefit uh, to the UK economy. There's a benefit also to households accessing products and services at better prices. There's a benefit to the educational standards achieved in those households and actually to the access to job opportunities uh, that those households have. So it's important um, as a matter of social policy and economic policy for us to think about how we can help those uh, remaining households get some of these benefits. And on the business side, I've talked briefly about the opportunity for businesses to grow faster and access international demand in a very efficient way. But it's not just about that, it's also business productivity, IT productivity. So a um, great example recently, ITV have started using uh, Google uh, services, so documents and email and so on. Um, moving, in, and there are others available, and they're all perfectly good. Moving from having them in your own IT, where you have to install disks in every computer and have lots of IT people around to um, reboot everything all the time, versus having something in the cloud where you just need a simple browser makes it much more cost efficient. But also, the benefits are not so much cost, they're the collaboration. So ITV were talking about an example where they had a production team working in lots of locations around a particular show. Um, and it would take uh, typically 13 hours of scripting and emailing versions of scripts backwards and forwards between people to get things sorted now, because they can all collaborate on a Google Doc at the same time, which they're all working on at the same time. It's done in 45 minutes. Apparently, the show is called Loose Women. Has anybody seen that? No? I don't know whether the script's good or not, but um, at least it's saving them time doing it. Um, and businesses can get information from the web. So one of the things that uh, our teams in the UK talk to retail businesses about, for example, is using tools like Google Trends. Google Trends allows you to get a snapshot of the level of searches for any word um, over time. And you can cut it by country. You can cut it by uh, industry sector that you're in. And you can uh, get some uh, useful data, not about what people told you in a survey three months ago, uh, they wanted to do, but what they're actually searching on Google for right now. It's not personal data, it's just you know, millions of people over time are searching for these things. And what retailers are able to do is look at if, I don't know, maxi dress is an example that I think is an interesting one. You can see that that's a seasonal level of interest over time. You can also see if you go, the trend goes back to 2007, you can see that maxi dress has actually become more and more popular uh, over time. Actually, I think it's falling away now, so I would invest don't invest in any more maxi dresses if you're in the market for those things. It looks like the trend's gone off the boil. But if you think about that for a minute, even if you don't have a website and you don't want to sell maxi dresses online, understanding that maxi dresses are becoming more popular and understanding the seasonality of interest will help you manage your working capital better, help you buy the right stuff at the right time and then sell out of it so you don't let, get left with a load of stock to write off. So businesses are using that kind of real-time data uh, to run better and make smarter uh, decisions. There's a big opportunity for productivity, collaboration, and better insight uh, for businesses. And then uh, in terms of uh, skills, I'd observe this on YouTube. My son plays football, and I have no idea how to play football. I'm terrible at it, but he wanted to learn how to do goal kicks. Well, what do you do? You go and look for how to do goal kicks on YouTube. You find a video, and actually, I've taught my son to do passable goal kicks despite having no talent whatsoever uh, in that sport. And I hear examples like that all the time. And it's not just uh, sort of sports and music uh, how-to guides. We also have on YouTube, YouTube Edu, educational YouTube. There are a 1,000 channels now um, where educational institutions are curating their content and sharing it with the world. And the number of subscribers on those channels has doubled in the last 12 months. So we're really seeing a revolution in online learning using platforms like YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and, uh, and, and other tools. But I think particularly online video is very powerful uh, there. Um, but actually, if you look at the UK, um, about a, a third of our students uh, in schools are using online uh, learning. And if you compare that with Finland, it's three quarters. 
Um, if you look at the UK, we're about 12% behind the European average in terms of how we use online learning uh, for children and schools. Um, and there are 800,000 children who no, have no internet access at home. And school, schools are starting to set homework, you know, encouraging them to use the internet, and there's 800,000 who don't even have internet access at home. And then in the particular specific skills area of computer science, I think this is a real shame. I think Alan Turing uh, would not be happy to see where this has gone. And I think you know, the guys who are building uh, the BBC Micro and the Sinclair Spectrum might be concerned that we're not making the most of our uh, innovation heritage here. Um, the IBM CEO said that last year they had a bunch of jobs in the UK to fill technical jobs, information technology jobs. One in five of those jobs went unfilled because they couldn't find the candidates. Um, in the 1980s, we were the gold standard here. And in 2011, the percentage of A-level students taking computer science was 0.5%. I feel that's a real shame. That's one of the challenges uh, for the UK. And I think it's great to see the work that Ian Livingstone has done for the government to try to encourage people back to an agenda where IT doesn't mean learning how to use PowerPoint. It means learning how to write code and writing apps. And I think it's uh, a big step forward that we start to get our children inspired to do that. It'd be great to see the BBC doing something like the BBC Micro uh, again to drive computer literacy. The Raspberry Pi might be a part of that uh, program. Let's hope so. So a big opportunity for us to get back to what's important in computer science and building apps for five, five billion people. And then infrastructure. So the UK has got reasonable infrastructure in terms of broadband and mobile infrastructure. Actually, the most important aspect of infrastructure now is, is, is uh, mobile internet because the growth of the smartphone is a huge shift. And we need to make sure that our consumers are able to access everything on their smartphones. And we need to make sure that our businesses are thinking about how they use smartphones and tablets. Uh, because that's a huge growth that we're seeing. In the UK, on Google, we now get a quarter or more of our searches come from mobile devices, tablets and smartphones. Last year, it was 12%. So this is doubling every year. And businesses are nowhere uh, near ready for that. But also, our infrastructure is not ready. So in the UK, you may have seen big billboards from everything everywhere advertising the new 4G uh, service for mobile. The other players will be able to be in the market, I think, in the spring of next year. Um, that's good. But we're behind lots of other countries. Um, the mobile broadband speed in New York is four times faster than the mobile broadband speed in London. The UK is behind the US and Japan and Korea in uh, 4G uh, technology for mobile. Its download speeds will be a lot faster there. So it's not surprising, perhaps, that we're behind the Koreans uh, and the Japanese in the US, but we're also behind the Lithuanians, the Estonians, the, Argentinians, the Argentines, and the Uzbekis. So we've got a bit of work to do if we want to keep up <laughs> with that pace and the shift towards 5 billion uh, people online. And then government itself can play a role here, not just in education policy, but also in how it goes about interacting with its citizens. Digital delivery has been estimated to have a potential to save government 5 billion pounds a year. Um, there are about a billion citizen government interactions every year, and over half, only half of them have got online options. Or if you look at it by service rather than number of interactions, um, there are 650-odd government services that citizens uh, access and could be accessed online, and only 300 of them are accessed online today. So there's a big opportunity for us to, us to step up a gear there. About a third of UK adults are making use of the online opportunity to interact with government. When they do, it reduces the costs for government and actually improves the service for adults. So DVLC is a good example of a success uh, story there. So a third of UK adults are using these services. In Denmark and Norway, it's three quarters of adults. So it's a big opportunity for government to play a role in driving that too. So I think we've got an interesting position, a proud history, an opportunity to get it right, and we're doing reasonably well right now. But it is all to play for in the next uh, couple of years because nobody is standing still in this space, least of all the consumer. So if you go back to the imagery from the opening ceremony, um, the furnaces and chimneys of the Industrial Revolution are now the phones and the fiber optics uh, of today. And we're at the start of this second great industrial uh, revolution. And the question is, can we make the web work for us? Can we take the gift, this is for everyone, and actually make it work for everyone in the UK and make it work for the UK um, across the world with five billion people? We're already a great nation of digital shopkeepers. We're good at this. We're actually world leading in the proportion of GDP that comes from the internet economy. Um, but that will require uh, us to consider industrial policy, education policy, economic policy, and growth policy in the light of the fact the internet and the real world are the same place. 
This is for everyone, it's for every person, it's for every household, it's for every business, but it's also for every aspect of policy to play a part. So I again will just pose the question, uh, can we build on our innovation history or will we become innovation history? Over to you to discuss, thank you very much.